Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, this is Shweta. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. I hope you're all doing well and uh, staying safe at this point in time. Uh, today, we are here for a webinar on behavior change and recycling contamination. We have Adam Reed, who's moderating this panel. Adam has moderated many other panels for us since last year. So please head to our video panel section on the website if you haven't seen them, and you will find all of them there. And uh, Adam is going to talk to uh, Stephen Bates. He's a behavior change communications expert. Uh, we also have Sarah Ottaway, sustainability and social value lead at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK, and Gemma Scott from Resource London. And uh, you won't be able to see Gemma today because of a technical hitch, but she'll surely make up for what she says to that. So uh, we already got several of your questions along with your registration, which have uh, been passed on to Adam. He's going to incorporate them in his conversation with the panelists. But do remember, please feel free to share your questions. As the panel is happening, Adam will ensure that the questions are answered. Please use the Q&A section via, to uh, put up your questions. So yes, over to you, Adam. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Sweta. And, uh... Good morning, everybody. There's a huge number of you joining or have already joined. It's great to see you so bright and breezy talking about a topic that is very close to my heart. So yes, I'm Dr. Adam Reid, the External Affairs Director at Suez and one of Sweater's uh, well-honed uh, facilitators, shall we say. My job is to get us through the next 58 minutes, finish on time, get as many questions answered and ensure that the, uh, the panelists stick to time and stick to topic. So you've been warned. Um, contamination, very close to my heart. 26 years ago, I came into this sector doing door-to-door -door -door knocking, uh, engaging residents with why they weren't recycling often enough, and when they were, why they weren't getting it right in the wrong bin or the wrong material. So in some respects, it's great to be back 26 years later talking to some real experts, because let's be honest, I was making it up as I went along back then. Um, real experts about how they've been dealing with contamination over these, you know, the last decade or two, you know, what are the current issues? What are the, what are the problem materials? What are the, uh, what are the engagement techniques that really work? And hopefully giving you a few takeaway messages so you can go back to base and, and implement some rapid change and get some, some real improvement in the, in the short term. It's also a pleasure to, uh, to bring three excellent panelists uh, to you today because Steve and I go back way too many years. Um, we, we've done behaviour change when behaviour wasn't even a word in the waste industry. So look forward to hearing from Steve. Sarah currently works for me, but I've known Sarah by a reputation for a lot longer. She knows more about contamination and, and engagement than I do. And then you've got Gemma who's going to, uh, Gemma and I knocked around in London quite a bit back in the day when we were recycling officers. And Gemma's going to bring us a bit of insight into how we deal with high rise, which I think is a, a problem for many places around the world. You know, those people that are living in communities communal housing and, and, you know, don't have the space to do the, the usual recycling that suburbia might like. So anyway, that's what we've got lined up. I'm going to kick off with Sarah Ottaway today. Sarah, welcome. Always good to see you, bright and breezy. What are you going to tell us? Thanks, Adam. Well, I am going to be uh, sharing some, some key case studies from what we've been up to in Suez over the past few years, which hopefully sets a bit of the scene for everyone and also uh, kind of shows everyone what we've been up to because we, we've done a lot of work in this area. As you say, we've been, we've been pretty busy. Um, so uh, have we got the slides, Sweater, and we'll, uh, I'll start sharing with everyone what we've been up to. So kind of three key areas to, to share with you all. And uh, the first one of those is around direct householder intervention. How are we doing? Keep talking. Look, you going? Okay, there we go. So once they appear, you will see that uh, that, that first uh, intervention took place in Calderdale, which is in the north of England. Um, it was the evolution of a process that we've been working on for a number of years. And what we wanted to do when we introduced this particular one was to actively monitor it over a long period of time. Uh, this was a 12 month period to really understand what was going on and whether the results that we were seeing were, um, or the results that we were seeing elsewhere really uh, were holding true and we could act actively demonstrate the, the impact of, of uh, what we were seeing on the ground. So the service is a source segregated service. So it's curbside sort, so multiple bags and boxes of people put it, putting their uh, different recyclables into. But this process is also successfully used on commingled collections as well. So it's a three-step process which uses a, a tag that's attached to uh, the particular container by the collection crew. It's then reported through a, uh, through a computer system that we have on board. Uh, if the same thing happens second time, 
And then a letter is sent directly to the resident to say, to give them a little bit more detail about what the, what the problem was. And then if they're reported for a third time, it's a face-to-face -face interaction. So the local officer there will go and knock on their door and try and have a chat with them. So the important points for these is about getting the messages right. Um, and the, the key principles, which you can see on the tag, which I've put up there as an example, is that we try to use as few words as possible to make it really easy to understand what the problem is and what they need to do differently. And it all comes back to the really key principle of helping the reader to understand this um, uh, in a really easy to use way, because that's going to increase the chance of them taking the message on board and changing their behavior. And you can see from the result over that 12 month period, we saw a really impressive response. Um, you know, 84% of those that received a tag actively changed their behavior. They weren't reported again. And that then all the way down to the visit, 97% of people we went and had a chat with on the doorstep actively changed their behavior. And we went out and did some monitoring on the ground to make sure that the data we were seeing coming through the computer system that we use with our crews was uh, being backed up with what was actually happening on the ground. We also saw uh, an increase in the recycling that we were capturing, A, because we were picking up more because the crews weren't having to reject bags and boxes, but also because we were communicating with householders, they were understanding what they could recycle more, so they were putting more out for collection. But the biggest impact of all was around the amount of staff time that we were saving. So because crews were not having to deal with contamination, were not having to use the tags, uh, not having to deal with materials in the wrong place, they were able to complete their rounds quicker. So that's 615 hours of staff time that was saved over that 12 month period. So that's one person working for about 15 weeks or a crew of three for about five weeks. So that's a huge saving. And that's where, when we are trying to support the business case for investing in behavioral communications, and that's where it's really important to look not just at what we're trying to uh, influence, but the broader picture that it's a part of. Uh, next one, please. So the other examples around flats and communal areas, this is where we replaced the uh, bins on site with a clear sided bin so the crews could really see what was going on. So this is where commingled collections were being used. They were put out for a number of weeks, so we, this was a, a long term intervention, so we put them out for about 12, 13 weeks at a time and then replaced them at the end with, uh, with the standard containers again. Communications here were also really important. So we communicated with the residents at the beginning, during the intervention, particularly if there was problems with contamination ongoing and at the end as well. We also engaged with the caretakers and the staff and I'm sure uh, Gemma's gonna be sharing more around what they've been doing in London around this as well. Um, but the really interesting part here and what I wanted to share was it wasn't just about the change that happened during the intervention because there wasn't a great deal of change. The, the amount of contamination, even though the reports remain the same, did reduce in terms of the amount that was being found, but the biggest change came after we put the containers back. And actually we would monitor material quality for the entire period. And we noticed that there was no change once those uh, original bins went back in. So it remained static. So we didn't improve material quality overall, but we did make sure that we uh, changed the residents' behavior throughout that intervention. And also we increased recycling at the same time for the same reasons. And the last one, that we, I was going to share with you was around a collection crews. Obviously incredibly important for both those two examples that I shared with you, but also we need to sometimes influence their behavior as well. It's not just about the householders or the users at the front end. It's sometimes about the decisions that the crews are making. So this was a particular example that in East Devon, which is again a curbside sort contract, we um, had some issues with paper. So this was particularly towards the end of last year, where in the UK, the fiber market was really um, in decline, prices were going down, quality expectations were going up. And even though there was never issues before this time, the, um, the expectations increased to the point where the reprocessor was saying, we're going to have to consider putting your prices up and potentially rejecting loads. So we worked with our crews. So we um, were doing yard checks, toolbox talks, various education interventions to help them make sure they were making the right decisions at the curbside and sorting properly uh, and making sure um, because in the container that the, uh, the paper goes in, you also often will get glass, card and textiles. Hence why those three images are on the, uh, the slide that I've put on the, uh, what you can see there. And what, the, uh, what would often happen is that the crews weren't always separating them uh, because they were trying to get through the round as quick as possible, as I'm sure everyone can, uh, edit, can uh, recognize as well. So through doing those interventions, not only did we um, 
make sure that no loads of paper actually ended up being rejected, but we also increased the price by £32 per tonne, which when the fibres market was in such steep decline was an incredibly impressive result. And the work that we've done there has actually gone on to help support some of the other work that we're doing on fibre separation elsewhere in East Devon as well. So that's kind of the examples of what we've been up to. And I, hopefully there's uh, some questions out of those that I can answer later on. There's hundreds of questions already, Sarah. Thank you. I, what I'm <laughs> impressed with is, is numbers. I love numbers. I love uplifts. I love Im improvement. But the questions that, that are coming through, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick ones. Okay. So what evidence base were you using to pick the interventions that you've, you've suggested there? So uh, the evidence bases were, so for Doncaster, for that communal properties, they were the ones uh, which were high reports of contamination. So we made sure we picked ones that were, were bad performers. And for Coldsdale, see that's blanket across the whole area. Um, and OK, thank you. And were the crews victimised in any way or did the, did the public feel antagonised? You know, were they an antagonised by, by, you know, this kind of change in behaviour? What kind of feedback did you get from, from, from the punters? So to be honest, the vast majority were positive. We had, um, especially in the early stages, we had a couple of calls in from residents who were insistent that they had never contaminated, even if we had pictures and all the other things that you can often capture at the curbside. Um, but again, a, a visit normally, or a conversation over the phone normally puts those right. But no, as far as I'm aware, we've never received any reports of angry residents taking out on our cruise in this intent for this intervention. And, and finally, what's the kind of cost profile for some of these interventions? Because... You talk about increasing value of material, you talk about, you know, staff time being saved, but, but surely there was staff time being used. Absolutely. So uh, the best example of the three of those is the first ones, that direct householder intervention in Calderdale. And um, the, the value from that over those 12 months actually paid for the officers full wages for a year, just from that one intervention, to give you an example. Um, of kind of the cost benefit ratio. Fabulous. I'm going to hold some of these other questions because I'm sure there's um, there's relevance to our other two speakers. So let's uh, let's let's move on and keep going. Brilliant start though. Thank you, Sarah. So second up, Mr. Steve Bates, um, a man of, of many words, and you've got five minutes, so not too many words. Um, what have you got to share with us today, mate? Okay. Well, I've got uh, three examples of where we've used communications to. Uh, influence uh, contamination levels. So just to explain, my role is I'm not a behaviour change scientist. I, I communicate the science of behaviour change direct to the residents. And the, the first one I'd like to share with you is how we tackled uh, on-the-go recycling. If I can have the next slide, please. So this is North Cyprus. Uh, many of you will be aware of the unique uh, political situation in, in the north of uh, Cyprus. This, they don't have formal recycling there. Instead, what recycling happens is done by a civil society organisation. And there's one which collects drink cans, uh, which it then sells uh, and raises money for children's hospitals and children's healthcare, very worthy cause. Trouble is, uh, the container that they collect the cans in uh, resembles uh, a similar uh, container that a commercial operator collects plastic bottles in. Now, the north of Cyprus, the people there are very keen to recycle, but they, they, they're not going to really read too much. They need to be uh, shown how to recycle, and it needs to be very obvious. And as you can see from here, um, you've got plastic, you've got cans. It's, it's a complete mishmash. And because it's an informal system, there isn't the resource to separate that out. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see a campaign that we created. It was part of a multi-material campaign that A, promoted the, the fact that people can recycle, where to recycle. Uh, and the key thing that we did here was to transition the, the, the visual uh, that you see on that advertising to the next slide, which is putting that same visual directly on the, the point at which people interact with those cages. And as you can see, there is still some contamination there, but it's transformed uh, the amount of material, or correct material that's collected. Uh, it also had the, 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 the benefit of increasing the, the uh, amount of material that was captured and therefore the amount of money that that particular civil organization raised. So the learning there was to integrate your communications through all channels up to and including the point at which people interact with the, the, the means with which they can recycle. Now, nipping back to the UK, um, this is uh, a, a really good example of how comms is an investment. 
Uh, often local authorities, public sector see cost uh, or communication simply as a cost. In fact, if it's done right, you actually see a return. Now, this was a piece of work we did in Warwickshire back between 2015 and 17, I think. Um, five different local authority areas within Warwickshire. Uh, they had a garden food waste bin, dry recycling bin and a residual bin. The problem was, as you can see from the next slide, most people, a lot of people were putting food into the residual bin. This was causing a big problem uh, because food waste uh, weighs an awful lot. And in the UK, uh, the, the, the money that the councils pay is, is geared around the weight uh, of, of, of the bins. Um, each individual borough and district had previously done some visual communication, so leaflets and uh, some street side advertising, but there were about 40,000 homes spread across the whole of the county area uh, that were still uh, putting the, the, the food waste in the wrong uh, bin. So we were deployed, we were knocking on doors, we were talking to residents, we were explaining the problem. Uh, that was super successful. And as you can see from the next slide, the gains that we got from that, from an £80,000 fee, a 25% reduction in food waste, uh, which resulted in a £950,000 per annum saving. So that was a, demonstrates clearly that if you invest in communications, and that is investment is, is place correctly and you instigate the right processes, you will see a financial return and it should never be seen simply as a cost. Now, the last example I'll show you, uh, again in the UK, we heard from Sarah earlier about uh, crew uh, behaviours and engaging with the crews and this is one really good example of that. If you have the next slide. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Hull, which is in the northeast of uh, the UK, um, appeared in a BBC report as one of the most highly contaminated cities in terms of recycling in the UK. There were about 10 and at the time uh, Hull were recording about 18% contamination. It was costing them close to £600,000 a year. They tried all uh, manner of, of ways to sort of address that and they eventually came to us. So we developed a, a whole range uh, of communications that, that, that were intended uh, to stimulate people into to doing the right thing. And something we've always found is that most people, by orders of magnitude, are quite willing to recycle. They do want to do the right thing. Sometimes they just don't know and sometimes they forget. So one of the interventions that we did, if we can just have the next slide, please, um, was to do some uh, sort of odd engagement. We, we went on two weeks, we sent our teams out ahead of the collection crews to check the recycling bins for contamination. If they were contaminated, uh, the guys and girls would put a sticker on it. And then when the crews turned up, they knew that they wouldn't be collecting that bin. We then went back later in the day to explain to the resident why their bin hadn't been collected. The response was actually surprisingly positive. But what happened was after that two week period, and we then transitioned back into just normal uh, door knocking and education, the contamination where over those first two weeks had gone down to pretty much zero, went back up again. And we couldn't work this out because the crews were supposed, we'd been educating the crews on what contamination it to be looking for and what, what, was, uh, what, what bins needed to be rejected for forensic. So we couldn't quite work out what was going on. So we looked at the crew behavior and what was happening was they were operating to the, the systems that had been in place for years, very unionized. And they had this thing in place where once the crews had conducted their work for the day, they were free to go home. So consequently, any intervention that prevented them from getting finished early was, was avoided. Um, and so, as a consequence of that, you had uh, trucks going around whole, looking like they're being driven by Lewis Hamilton because they want to finish earlier. So what we had to do was to sort of pull back, engage with the crews, explain to them why uh, they needed to exert attention and effort in, in looking at what, what bins to reject and what to empty. Uh, and as a result of that, the contamination rate has continued to, to decline. So just a, a little recap on my last slide, if you can go forward. Key learnings, integrate your communications visually up to and including the point of disposal and be bold and be creative. Um, 
we are bombarded with marketing messages and, and local authorities don't have the budgets of Coca-Cola and such like. So you need to be creative in your comms and that creativity needs to be seen at every point through the, the, the process of engagement up to a, a point of uh, where people put their recycling in. We need to engage directly where it's needed the most. Don't just purely rely on one channel of communication. You need to look at the areas uh, that are causing the problem and engage directly with those. Check your services before the population. Don't go out and think that communication is gonna solve anything. It can just paper over cracks. So you need to deal with the cracks before you communicate. And most of all, invest in your communications. Do treat it as an investment. Thank you, Steve. That, you, that five you, minutes, thank you. It weren't bad, mate, weren't bad. You were pretty much there. So quick question. Somebody wants to ask about Cyprus and who actually paid for that intervention. Was it the municipality? Uh, that was the EU. Uh, there's an EU project over there which is uh, trying to uh, bring some kind of unification between the North and the South, which always amuses me that they've employed a British guy, an EU employing a British guy to work on a reunification project. Um, but yeah, so that's a donor funded project. But the idea is that's now transitioned into uh, a, a wider North Coast project. Um, and the, the, the intention is that over the coming years, the municipalities uh, and indeed the civil society organisations will recognise through evidence that the, that the money that they're, they're spending on comms is seeing a, a, a financial return and they will self-finance it. As somebody that's worked internationally almost as much as me, um, do you think there's a need for an international bin labelling system to reduce customer consumer confusion? Something a bit like the road safety signs that you now see popping up uh, over the world. Question. Um, the answer is yes. The question is who would administer and own that? Who would be the institutional owner for such uh, a device? I think, um, I think beyond um, that, I would say that there's probably a, a stronger call for global unification in terms of on-pack recycling information. But then ahead of that comes the need for unification and standardization of material types in packaging. Um, Fundamentally, yes, if we can tie up and, and, and sort of bring global or bring countries together in terms of how they communicate recycling together, I think that will be a good thing. Final one for you, because um, the other ones are more general. I'm going to ask all three of you. But uh, in, in the Hull example, how much crew training was, was involved and, and how, did this, how, did, how did the crews you know, react to that? The, um, we initially did uh, crew training by means of um, uh, sort of half hour workshops and initially that was just purely to inform them of the work that we were doing because the first two weeks uh, we had to work in close collaboration with each of the, 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 the crews because they needed to know that we'd be ahead of them if, if they were catching us up to hold back and so on. We explained to them the purpose of what was being done. So we held a series of workshops so they were aware of what we were doing, why we were doing it, and so on. Um, when it was determined that, the, that, that there was a, a crew originated issue that was impacting on, on the, the uh, contamination, that then led to, to much more expansive um, engagement with the crews. It didn't go down too well, uh, I'll be honest with you, and it, it was partly because of the relationship between the, 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 the council and the crews, um, it was a self-collecting, they didn't contract out, it was very heavily unionised. These guys were being asked to sort of stay back for an hour for, for extended training. So it was quite a difficult um, situation to overcome um, and it fell beyond our remit sadly, but the council did manage to sort of win them over eventually and we're seeing the results now. Uh, and Sarah, crew training, something you've been heavily involved in uh, over the years. I mean, we, we now do it kind of just as part and parcel of the day job don't we we do and i think uh, reflecting on stephen's point as well i think this is where having someone who is so involved day to day with the crews builds that relationship as well so the officers that we have are based locally so they're not just there for the interventions there they build those day-to-day -day relationships they know the personalities they know who the you know the, the ones with the big mouths are so that you can obviously work with them because obviously they influence everyone around them and um, so having that local connection is really important and, and really helps to drive these messages home especially when it's training and you've got some difficult difficult things to work through with them 
Good, good lessons. Right, come on, Gemma. You've been sitting there quietly. Uh, I know we can't see you, but I'm enjoying seeing your name on the screen. Gemma, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, my name's Gemma. I work for Resource London, and I lead on all of the um, all of the work um, that we do in London around improving flats. Actually, um, just the next slide, please, Rita. Thank you. So just to give you an idea, I'm going to talk you through a project that we have run over the last two years. Um, which I have to say, um, originally was all around how we can increase recycling in flats through improving the amount of material that people were putting into the recycling bins. Um, next slide, please, Sweater. But actually, um, what, what happened in the, e in the end is that it became very, very apparent that, um, that the quality of the material that we were getting um, in, in the recycling bins was so poor and, and contamination rates were so high um, so we were looking kind of in the 31, just, just shy of a third of, of the material in the recycling bins was contaminated, that we realised very quickly that the project had to, had to look at um, how to tackle um, the issues that the contamination was actually creating. So we, like I said, we did a, we did a load of research at the beginning. Um, we looked at over 150 um, estates, um, so blocks of flats, and we realised quite quickly that a lot of the a lot of the services that were being provided by um, for those residents were quite poor quality so for example you can see an example there um, on the bottom bottom uh, right of your screen um, signage was really poor or non-existent um, you know how can you expect people to be, to be recycling correctly if the signage is poor um, and there was lots of issues with um, overflowing bins so, you know, people were very often ending up putting their residual into recycling bins because the residual collections weren't, um, weren't properly in place. Um, big issues with bulky waste dumping. So you can see from that bottom left photo and from the middle one as well, actually, um, that there was bulky waste dumping. That was kind of leading people. A, to, it was, a, they were finding it quite difficult to use the bins or even to get into the bin rooms in some occasions. So again, they were just dumping their, whatever waste they could get into the, the closest bin. Um, in effect, and that was leading to huge issues in contamination as well. Um, the, as I said, the uh, contamination was extremely high, so nearly a third of what was going in the recycling bin was, was, was contamination. Quite low capture rates and, and very low recycling performance as well, so around 11%. I think one of, the, one of the key things from this project was making sure that we actually approached the whole issue of recycling performance and contamination. From the point of view of the residents, um, we needed to understand what residents felt um, um, about their recycling services in order to have any any attempt um, to, to improve that. So next slide please, Sweater, and um, this is a video basically showing you that we, we actually spoke to real people <laughs> living on real estates in London. Do they exist? Um, <laughs> to, uh, to ask them what, you know, what was, what was their experience of the service? And this video is all about um, the issues that they were having, getting good information um, and knowledge. Um, so if, you, if you're able to play that, Sweater, that would be that would be great. While we're waiting, what kind of contamination rates were we talking about, Gemma? So with, um, overall contamination rates were 31%, but you had some estates that were as kind, of, kind of as high as nearly 50. Thanks. So um, um, yeah, quite, quite scary so, rates really. Should I play the video now? Uh, yes, please, which, okay. Can anyone hear that? No. Okay, so I mean, I might as well kind of mic over the top, almost MC over the top. Um, but basically, people were telling us that they um, they were really confused about what they what they what they could recycle. Um, they weren't sure. They felt that they weren't getting good information. They felt that the information that they were getting once they got to the bins was poor quality. So, for example, their, um, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't clear what they could recycle and what they couldn't recycle. Um, people were most confused around plastics. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a guy actually who's got a really good explanation of holding a, um, some plastic film that went around um, some tomatoes and just assuming that that's what, it, that's what went in, that the film could go in as well because he... You know, just just wasn't sure. So I think what residents were telling us is that 
getting him access to good quality information was absolutely critical. Um, and that along with, along with a, a good quality service as well. So um, if we just, we might as well close that down now because it's not helping us. <laughs> um, the link will be made available afterwards so people can enjoy it after with a cup of coffee. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's well worth, it's well worth, it's well worth a watch because um, I think as waste professionals, it's really easy to assume what we think people want and what we, what we, we assume what their issues are, but actually speaking to people in their homes um, where they're comfortable. Um, it's important to say that we didn't tell them it was about recycling and waste either until quite far into the interviews and um, gave us a really good insight. So basically we took all of, all of the knowledge that we had from residents um, from the inventories that we did um, and we implemented um, what we're calling a flats recycling package and we're actually recommending that's rolled out across all, um, all flats um, in London. But basically in a nutshell it's just providing residents with a good quality and well communicated service um, and that in itself um, led to huge increases in both recycling performance um, decreased contamination and improved capture rate um, and I'll, I'll talk to you through just what those those improvements were in a minute but just looking at the screen here that's just showing you some some photos of that flats recycling package so that good quality service that we rolled out across the estates where we trialed it um, because we knew that the contaminate the main contaminants were food waste and textiles um, and plastic film we could actually put that on the signage behind the bin so the top left hand corner there you can see some really good clear signage tells you what you can but also what the key contaminants are importantly those bins and you can see that from the top left and some of the bin photos they were reverse lidded bins so people couldn't try and kind of jemmy them open from the front um, that that had a big impact on on improving contamination um, we had um, on the, the um, on the right hand uh, right hand side there. You've got um, a leaflet. There were those were delivered every year, and you've also got um, posters, really clear posters that were put in um, in every stairwell, basically where there were when notice boards as well. Um, and in terms of the improvements, um, we saw um, a twenty six percent increase overall in recycling rates. Wow. Um, 22% uh, increase in capture rates um, and a 24% decrease in contamination rates. So the contamination rate, for example, went from 31% on average across all the estates to 23, which is still obviously very high. Um, but I think it shows you the inroads that we have made just by putting in a good quality and well communicated service, um, which residents deserve um, at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's my uh, my my, le my leave leaving message, I guess, is make sure you provide residents with good quality, well communicated services. And if you do that, you're kind of halfway there. Very positive, Gemma. Thank you. Uh, you can leave that screen up for a moment. Swear to a couple of questions for Gemma. Um, somebody said they love the fact that you're using the word rubbish. Why has it fallen out of fashion? Um, <laughs> I mean, when you speak to people, that's what they call it. Um, you know, we, you know, we had those in-depth interviews. We sat in people's homes for, a, you know, an hour and a half. We had, um, we had, we had um, video recording equipment in people's homes over a period of two weeks, obviously with their permission. <laughs> um, and there was some pretty interesting video footage, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, people, people call it rubbish. We wanted to understand what their, what their habits were and what the behaviours were. Um, and you can only do that by speaking to people. Okay, next question then. Uh, London specific one, high rise specific, and it's about the Grenfell tragedy. For, for those on the, the line that don't, don't know, that was a high rise building that, that went up in smoke and, and, and a lot of people lost, lost their lives. This has had an impact on waste and recycling storage in, in communal high rise residential properties. Is that having an impact, Gemma, on how we do some of this? I mean, what's, what's its legacy for, for maybe the design of, of new bin stores? I think you just need to make sure um, that the, the, the bin stores are you know fireproofed and they, and they all are these days and they need to be um, we had a mix of kind of internal and external um, and so just with external ones you just need to make sure that they you know they're not right below windows um, where possible um, so yeah I think all, all very sensible things really um, but a lot of that's in place I think actually one of the things worth saying is one of the interventions that I haven't talked through but that we actually implemented on some of the estates to improve recycling performance was to provide everybody with a um, uh, single-use plastic bags to store recycling in their home 
And rather than delivering those out every quarter or whatever that a lot of authorities do, we actually put in um, bag dispensers um, to every block so that they could actually just pull a, pull a bag out when they wanted it. Um, and we wanted to put those inside the lobbies of every building. Um, you know, just so that, you know, they're front of, front of mind as soon as you walk in and, and they're not affected by the rain and, and, and the weather. And actually we weren't allowed to do that because of the fire risks around putting those, um, those bags in. And that was directly as a result of Grenfell. So there are, you know, there definitely is fallout from that. Right. Two final questions for you. And I might bring the others into these as well. Um, your results, although good, aren't great. Somebody else's words, not mine. Um, mm -hmm. So how is it that we can convince councils, municipalities to invest in contamination communication if we don't always have obvious waste related savings to hand? I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's a tricky one. I think the thing around, there's a, there's a whole piece, I think, around additional benefits, though, of contamination sure. um, that are really, really hard to quantify in monetary terms. Um, so, I mean, on a lot of, a lot of our estates, um, we found that people just didn't, didn't have any kind of com community cohesion. So they, they kind of, because the estate wasn't being looked after, for example, um, maybe there was graffiti everywhere and there was big issues that therefore led to big issues with dumping, um, and therefore people dumping, um, materials that, you know, dumping rubbish in recycling bins, because there was a general kind of feeling of lack of, you know, lack of community spirit and cohesion. So I think they're all, all of these things are kind of interlinked actually i don't think you can see you can't see contamination on its own it, it's just um the repercussions of it and the causes of it are far and wide on, on, on specific estates okay quick i'm going to open it up to um, sarah and steve here there's a question here about alleyways and the fact that many of these uh communal housing and, and you know tight-knit high density housing um don't have bin storage really even in their garden so how do we get residential relationships to their waste and their resources better what can we do about that steve any any immediate thoughts uh yeah it would, funny enough a couple of uh, about 18 months ago we worked on a project dealing with that very same thing it was a, what we call a warren estate built in the early 60s as a uh what was then considered to be a the future of social housing and it wasn't it was terrible and the as you, as you rightly say no provision was made for what was to become the need to, to store several bins so alleyways were, were used as, as storage not just on bin collection day but throughout the week um, this those sorts of estates tend to have very good community um, groups and community organizations that, that, that kind of emerge from people who live there um, and the trick is finding the community leader uh, and engaging with them and encouraging them to become an advocate for the, the, the things that you want the residents to do. Uh, it's very difficult because those sorts of areas tend to attract residents uh, on the, the lower rungs of society whose concerns go way beyond what goes in what box and where to put the bin. Uh, that's why you need those community leaders to, to act as your advocate on the ground with the people that are causing the problem. Thank you. And Sarah, should we be rewarding people for recycling well? It depends what we mean by reward. We should be congratulating them. Cash. They've done it right. Cash. I, I, I think we've got plenty of evidence to show that, that the communications or would suggest that the communications are just as effective on their own without the financial reward. But I think we should be telling people when they get it right. So that's something we did at the on the communal project in Doncaster that I mentioned before is that that um, before we went back to the standardized bins, we thanked everyone for what they did. We gave them some results. So we showed them that change that had happened over time so that they could see that, especially those that had made a change, that it had been worth it and it was there was value to what they were doing. I think I'd also add on to Stephen's point in terms of the alleyways, that's something that we've also done in Doncaster, learning from what, what we've done from householder communication and for, householder contamination intervention is our biggest challenge when it came to alleyways was finding out whose bin was who. Um, because people will often put bins and boxes in different places and they'll end up all scattered up and down alleyways all over the place. So one of the interventions that has been done there is placing stickers with a reminder about the service, but also the number of the property so that you can link those to the property as well. So Very you can good. Right. So many questions. 
I'm going to start cutting you short and ask you for sound bite answers in a minute, but let's do some polls. I've got three questions. I want to get all 200 of the audience involved. There's an opportunity for them to tell us what they think. You know, maybe it's a mandate for future activity. Maybe it's just, you know, some headlines for a future blog. So here we go. I'm going to launch the first poll. Hopefully you can see this, everybody. What is the greatest impact of contamination on your system or service? So if you're a local authority or a service provider, which one of these is it the political fallout because contamination is undermining your your message is it the costs incurred is it your reduced efficiency of the service is it the environment that's being degraded because of uh, the contamination and reduced recycling rates or no contamination has no impact whatsoever we're, we're not worried about it so i'm going to count you down come on we've got a third of you vote come on guys and girls move those fingers and i'm going to pick on one of my esteemed panelists to comment on this in a moment so um i haven't decided which one yet and okay we're over halfway now so i'm counting you down you've got five seconds four seconds you know what comes next three two one thank you very much we're at 66 percent of you voting so that's probably enough for me end polling right sarah here we go the greatest impact of contamination is increased costs followed by reduced operational efficiency and i suppose they're either end of the uh, the same spectrum in, in respect is that how you see the world yeah very much so i think uh, you know the, the example that we gave in coldale you obviously could we could see where that direct benefit came from uh, increased costs particularly you know for in terms of sorting and, and everything that happens at the end so so yes completely concurrent with what with what we're seeing but also where we're seeing where we can make the most benefit as well and it also supports that business case so being able to understand what it is how we're making a benefit can uh, encourage those purse string holders to you know to loosen them and give us some access to that cash and steve thankfully nobody on the call because clearly everybody in the call is interested in contamination thinks it's not a problem so you know that that one resonates well with you yeah yeah definitely with some future budgets coming your way maybe hopefully hopefully send them my way so uh next poll uh stop sharing results there we go is that yeah next poll here we go so here we go again everybody another opportunity to have a vote i'm going to pick on somebody again to comment launch polling so which of these interventions and you've heard about a whole heap of interventions today already i mean it's been fantastic coverage is the most successful in reducing contamination in your perspective so if you've had experience if you've implemented some different tests and trials if you've been on the end of some of these interventions as a resident that's a very valid opinion so is it the financial incentive somebody's already asked the question should we be paying people or maybe penalizing people is it penalties and fines the other side of the the, the positive spin is it mass advertising you know billboards national radio tv etc is it direct door to door you know in their face nudging and supporting or is it you know the reminders via social media the apps the the messaging the pings it's your recycling day remember um i'm going to count you down because more of you have voted on this one than the other ones this is fantastic five four three two one Gemma, get ready i'm coming your way and the answer is direct resident communication so does that surprise you going door to door and being in the face of of the of the customer is by far the strongest um intervention being supported here yeah no it doesn't doesn't surprise me at all and it's certain, certainly our experience as well but yeah. but is it the most expensive yeah i mean i guess i guess direct communicate resident communication can mean a number of things right so it could mean door to door and that I, you know, there is there are cost implications in that, and for a lot of people, that won't be possible because of the cost. But I think, I'll, you know, the project I just I just talked to you about shows that actually, just you know, clear communications to residents at the point at which they are depositing their waste, um, and providing them with a regular, you know, a regular leaflet actually has, you know, is is effective. So. Thank you. And Sarah, interestingly, 16% have gone, you know, the constant communication. That's actually more than have voted for financial incentives and penalties. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, I, I would agree with them all completely, you know, pen, penalties, that carrot, that really extreme carrot and stick effect. You know, I think both the example, both, so all the examples that we've talked about today shows that we can have that influence and encourage that change without needing to go to those extreme measures. Cool. Final poll coming up. Here we go. And then we'll get back to some of these I mean, honestly, the questions are flying in now. It's, um, it's, we should do these for two hours, Sweater. Okay? That's, my, that's my message now. So final poll. Here we go. Um, who should be most responsible, and I mean most, for reducing recycling contamination and improving the quality of recycling more generally? You can have two. 
because we knew this was a difficult question. So you pick the two you like. Is it national government? Is it the consumers? You know, it's their behavior. Is it the brands and the retailers? Maybe we need more on-pack labeling. Uh, maybe they could be doing more direct communication. I know Coca-Cola have done some in recent months. Is it the local authorities and municipalities who at the moment are the ones being tasked with dealing with it? Or is it their they are contractors, you know, Sarah and I are representing the private waste management companies today. Now, obviously, we don't work for every authority, but is it our responsibility? So good voting level so far. I'm going to count you down because we're over halfway already. Well done, everybody. It's an interesting mix. So is it national government? Is it the consumers themselves? Is it the brands or the retailers? Is it local authorities? I'm going to be very surprised by the answer to this one. Um, Steve, I'm coming your way in five, four, three, two, one. And the answer is just consumers, 61%, then the retailers and the brands, 48%, then the local authorities, 43 the people that currently are probably tasked with doing it the most. So what do you reckon, Steve? Is, how does that sit with you? Uh, I'm not surprised because I think consumers ultimately have the, the, the last line of, of responsibility and option to do the right thing. Um, they're, they're the ones that are holding the, the, the item that needs to be disposed of and they that therefore have the option or the ability to do the right thing with it. However, the brands need, I think, quite rightly to be more uh, implicit in so, or, or look at what, what materials they're using to make it easier for consumers to recycle. And then the local authorities and the national government need to fund the communication to ensure that those consumers are doing the right thing. So it's kind of all of the above. Uh, but I think the order that's come out there is interesting because it, it kind of mirrors what I would think as well. Cool. And Sarah, somebody's already asked me, you know, a number of times today, I think they clearly want their question asked. Is the changes in deposit return scheme and in, in particular extended producer responsibility that are going to come across the whole of Europe, if not the world in, in the near future, is that going to a address some of that poll answer which is the brands need to take more responsibility because they're going to be paying more and is it going to reduce contamination do you think that's a really interesting question and i think it has the potential to because it will especially the deposit return schemes there will be more emphasis on the consumer returning their product to a certain place and in order for them to get their deposit they've got to put the right thing in so from that point of view it will it could well help uh, epr will also allow more funding and i think what we've shown again through all our examples is that if you put money in the right place we can really change and influence behavior um, and if you've got consistent messages coming from the brands coming from your local authority and those of us also involved in the chain then it has a, a a real potential to to reduce it but yeah funds used in the right way is probably the big one from that okay let's get into soundbite time so quick question all three of you start with you Gemma has contamination increased or decreased during COVID-19 um I, I if I'm honest I'm not entirely sure um I suspect it's probably it's probably increased slightly because people have have had a lack of space to put um, residual waste in because obviously people are living at, uh, at home at the moment all the time so I suspect it's probably gone slightly up and Steve. Yeah, gone up. what I've seen has certainly gone up certainly in my area okay Sarah we, we've seen something different haven't we yeah so I think I think generally speaking we've seen it come down we've seen quality um, you know, because people have had more time because they've been on lockdown had a little bit more time at home not rushing around um, as we normally do but on the flip side we're also seeing more PPE so obviously that's that's a real issue um, that we've seen to, to kind of counteract some of that that positivity. Now is now so somebody asked me a question right at the beginning, which was something about interventions and their ability to to to, to affect behaviour, and and they they asked a question about social you know demographics and and whether certain groups of people respond better to, to interventions or not. Now, it may be that Steve's, you know, what's happening in Basildon or Essex is different from what we're seeing in Kensington and Warwick, for instance. Is there a social dimension to this, Gem? I mean, your work with High Rise, that's a very yeah. different type of social group to, say, the residents of Warwick, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, uh, and our project basically showed that, that those estates that had younger people and higher predominance of renters had poorer performance okay. across the board. So that's what I've got to say about that. <laughs> Steve, you've worked yeah, I, over I, the place. So. I think it's right. I think we, something I've challenged several local authorities on is this idea that we, we, we need to constantly go for the low performing uh, areas. So when you look at the, 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 the types of people that, that exist within these lower performing areas, uh, they're more worried about where the next tin of baked beans is coming from rather than where that tin needs to go. And if you've thrown everything at it before, you've got to question 
whether or not you're going to be able to motivate and stimulate any change going forward. And I think what we need to do is either look at simplifying the recycling so you capture just the one single most valuable equipment. So everything, you plastic bottles and then everything else gets thrown away because that's something that can be very easily communicated, whether you adjust it or you abandon it altogether and concentrate on those areas where you're going to gain much more response. I think more needs to be done in terms of stratifying the areas and, and what you can expect from each different uh, social demographic group sure. to be able to do. So um, I'm going to ask you a different question, Sarah, because that's my prerogative. 21% um, recycling level contamination was what Gemma reported post her quite hefty uh, efforts uh, in commuter areas. We've seen contamination rates, you know, markedly different, highs and lows. Is 23%, 21%, 20% an acceptable level? Do we have to accept that our system will only ever be 80% efficient? Because that sounds like we're never going to capture all of the material. And, and that's quite disappointing. I, it is when you put it in those terms, but equally, you know, because in the day, I think all of us are purists and we want to get to 100% if we want to, you know, glass half full. But what we also, we have to, to look at it as a whole. Um, so obviously, you know, the results that Gemma's done, she's basically, you know, in London and other, where, you know, other places where we've done similar things, we've made massive improvements and it's about that continual improvement cycle. And also that's not the same as what's happening elsewhere. You know, we know in other parts, especially when we have uh, high quality curbside sort collections that our contaminant rate, our contamination rates are in the single digits. So we are achieving that high 90 percent so it's about partly the area and reflecting back on points that Stephen has just made um, but also uh, in terms of the service and what it is and what's possible within those areas in a in a high-rise block of flats being able to have separate containers for individual materials is going to be physically impossible so we have to balance out the bigger perspective can I can I can I just add as well but don't forget it's only contamination if you don't accept it so, you know, I think we probably need to, we need to look at how we, you know, we, we, better, we better provide services to, to people because, you know, we found textiles, for example, is it was a huge contaminant, contaminant and on those estates, we've now put in textile bins and we're doing waste comp analysis as soon as we're allowed to actually, you know, with the COVID issues. So we'll be producing a report that, that's kind of showing the impact of that on the competition for waste. I think that's a really important message, Gemma. I, I remember doing a contamination campaign a, a good decade ago, and, and the biggest uplift I could have was by bringing pots, tubs, and trays into the yes list, 20% uplift um, in performance and 20% and reduction in, in contamination. Fascinating, you know, that kind of local variance about what's accepted and, what, and what's not. And of course, that then might lead to confusion between what you and your neighbours do or you and your parents do or, or you and your friends do. So, uh, right, quick question. This is a great one. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to even tell you who asked it because he should have been on the panel today, but he was unavailable at the last minute. So Gareth Morton has asked, he sent this one in earlier, so I was, I was primed. What is the single biggest challenge to reducing contamination? This is a nice wrap up question because I'm conscious we've got five minutes left. Is it attitudinal? Is it behavioral? Is it access to good services? Is it the quality of the service? Is it general knowledge and awareness? Is it the crew, I'm gonna add? Where, where, where do you wanna go? Sarah, where, which one do you wanna pick? Is it one of those or are you gonna go, oh, it's all of those, Adam? Oh gosh, yeah. Well, each of them are factors, but I think the the person, the the part that's most responsible is is the consumer. You know, they they ultimately decide where that material ends up. If they put it in the bin, then it's not going to get recycled. If they don't put it in, you know, if they put it in the wrong uh, recycling container, then we, we have all the problems associated with contamination. So, Hashtag yeah, Sarah attitude and slash public. Meeting. Okay, so we'll call you out on that one. I, I, you know, if you give them a rubbish service, I'm, 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 you know, I think we've got to be a bit careful here, haven't we, Steve? Come on, what, what's, what's your thought on this one? Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, it, it's, it's the person holding the, the waste item that has ultimate responsibility, providing that they're, they're given the right information. So each of those uh, categories, each of those, those components support the other. The one that's not on there actually, uh, that I was going to try and mention in relation to the whole, are the processes, the people that are accepting the materials. Because there has been, I have seen, uh, a, a change in the tolerance of quality of material that is being delivered to them. So what was categorised as acceptable grade A material years ago has slip down to now being grade C. So people are doing the right things, continuing what they've already done, 
but by the time the material gets to the processor, the game has changed. So I think we need to bring the processors and the companies that are actually buying this material and reprocessing it into the fold as well. But ultimately, each one supports the other, but it comes down to the consumer at the end of the day, acting upon the information they've been given, their, their, their willingness to do so, their understanding as to why they're being asked to do it, and ultimately doing it. Okay, so Gemma, is the public more ready today than ever before you know let's be honest i've seen more thank yous and love letters written to bin men in the last six in the last three months than ever before you know and climate change is such a big issue it's on the horizon you know nobody's ignoring it anymore are the public ready to to hear the message and respond or are we still fighting an uphill battle with segments of society um i think we'll always fight uh, we'll always always be fighting an uphill battle with certain segments of society i think you know that's just the way it is but i think this you know we have a unique opportunity now um given the kind of love, you know, love your bin man kind of stuff that was going around. We've got to take advantage of that. We've really got to take advantage of that. But I think we need to, we need to realize that the whole industry is the solution. It's not, it's not just consumers for me. Um, and, you know, Stephen, you, you, you touched on that. It's the whole industry. The whole industry needs to transform itself to make it easier for people to do the right thing. Um, and whether that is improving communication, it's taking all the materials or more materials than we do currently, um, and having a consistent service as well. Consistency is so important. Um, you know, in London, you can go to one borough and you won't be able to put glass, for example, and you can go to another and you will, or, uh, you know, pots, tubs and trays are accepted in some areas and not in others. I mean, that's just not acceptable in society today. We, we, how can we ever hope to get contamination and performance under wraps if we don't have that service in place? That's a good takeaway message. So Steve's point, very valid, actually. I was, you know, somebody that spends a lot of time worrying about exports of, of materials to global, global chains and commodity systems. It's, um, yeah, as those restrictions start, to, start to, 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 to feed their way through the system, you're right, things that we might have gone, yeah, it's acceptable, just aren't anymore. And, and so that quality issue becomes ever more prevalent, which is why I think EPR reform is quite an interesting one, because it might change the dynamics, not only of the value chain, but also of the behaviours of, of different parts of the chain. So the last question, and then I'll ask you each for a, a soundbite to take away with. Um, what level of contamination is acceptable today and tomorrow? Steve? Oh, uh, well, let's go big, zero. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it, I, no I, but. I, I, just, <laughs> just zero. I'm not a technical, I, I don't fair about it, what, one, two percent, five percent, it depends on the, 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 the local economy, it depends on the local people, who, where it's going and so on. But Stop uh, digging a hole. What, none. You said none. We'll, no, we'll settle yeah, for none. No, Sarah, right. what are we going for? Uh, I can cover Steve. I think none. It was, <laughs> no. Wow, that, was, that would have been a really boring poll question. Gemma, what's the answer? Is it, is it none? I think I'm a bit more realistic. Um, <laughs> I think curb, curbside, so houses, I think you, we should be looking at the kind of below the, below the tens, so kind of five to eight, something like that, um, on, commingled that pragmatic. on commingled services and I think on, on communal services. I think if you can get it to as low as 12, 15, you're doing well. Well, there we go. Some, some stark reality and some hope. In, in equal measure. Thank you. So um, it's time for that one takeaway message, that one soundbite. If I'm going to go on Twitter in the next five minutes, what am I going to say about at Steve Bates? Steve, what's your takeaway message today? Keep engaging, keep communicating and keep it two way. Find out why people aren't recycling and re uh, aren't recycling correctly and respond to that. But keep talking to them. I really like that because we haven't we haven't heard the word listen too much today, I don't think. I think that's a really important message, mate, that you know we've got to understand and, and it's not always that they're doing it wrong because they're actively trying to stuff our system up. It may just be that they've got, you know, some myth in their head that needs to be corrected. And the only way to do that is to actually go and have that conversation, which is why I do like, you know, that sort of personal engagement. So, uh, Gemma, what's your, what's your hashtag takeaway soundbite, please? You just, you just stole my, my oh, stole the key sorry. word. Listen. Listen. Yeah, <laughs> listen to your residents, listen to your crews, listen to your caretakers and act on what they are saying. Wow. We haven't rehearsed this. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Sarah, what's your takeaway message? Um, I think I will go bigger and beyond uh, Stephen and German say we need to uh, look beyond what we're just trying to influence and look at the whole service because that's where some of the biggest benefits may potentially lie and behaviour change is really important to service delivery and both the industry and the wider environmental agenda needs to recognise it as such. Fantastic I mean honestly I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed my last 59 minutes um, 
question wise i think we're up at almost 100 now uh, we've dealt with some of them we parked some of them we will share those questions with the panelists uh, after today and we will get an answer posted back through through bwaste wise the slides will be available i promised that earlier they will be available um they'll either be emailed or a link will be emailed to you later um i'd like to thank my three panelists they've been excellent it's always an enjoy enjoyable hour when i get to spend time with friends who actually know what they're talking about so so thank you we haven't really touched the surface of contamination but what we have done is talked about what it is where it is who's responsible for it some of the intervention measures that have worked there's some great case studies you can follow up after Afterwards, we'll make the links available so brilliant I'd like to thank you the audience because you voted on our polls those polls are meaningless unless you have your say we will share the poll results with you because I think they're interesting take them back to your base take them back to your paymaster show them what the world is saying about the need for good communication and investment in, in programs so thank you for that um, sweater I think the floor is coming back to you but it's been an absolute pleasure I'm dr. Adam Reed as always and I'll see you at a webinar sometime soon thank you Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sarah, Gemma, and Stephen. This was actually a really, really good uh, webinar, and we managed to cover a lot of ground, several questions. And like uh, Adam did mention, we will be floating the questions which have not been answered with the panelists. We'll try to get the responses out. And in a couple of weeks, when the webinar goes up on our website, you will have answers to the questions. The polls will be up there. We will have links to all the case studies, the slides. Everything will be up on our website from where you can access it. Uh, just a reminder before we sign off, we have another webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. It is going to be about food waste and cities. So you can head to our website and register for that. That's uh, a free webinar as well. So thank you, folks. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at. So bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Cheers.